Well, hi there and welcome. Jonathan Faust here. Delighted to have you here for this guided meditation and Dharma talk. Let me uh, just announce a few things before we begin. I always like to uh, start with thank yous and acknowledgements. First of all, to our mindful movement teacher for today and to our mindful dialogue leaders after this session. Um, a wonderful event, if you'd like to string them all together, is the Monday night ex ex <laughs> the Monday night extravaganza, which starts at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time with mindful movement led by Anna, Rita, or Lynn, all wonderful teachers. And then here at 7.30 for the guided meditation, 8 p.m. for the talk. <clears throat> and then afterward, um, about 8.45, 8.50, you can join Mindful Dialogue, led by uh, Ray Manioki and Tara Cassidy. This is just a great way to connect with other people, and it's available freely for you. You can find those links, the Zoom links for Mindful Meditation, and the Zoom link for Mindful Dialogue is on my Facebook page or on my website. As well, this couldn't happen without our producers, without Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo for putting all this together and making it available. A thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this class and to my friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, which had been the host for so many years. There's a mailing list. Guess what? I have a mailing list. <laughs> I uh, offer a monthly kind of synopsis of the talks, all my photography for the month, other resources. That's available available if you'd like to sign up on web website. And there's also a weekly, which kind of gives you a heads up on the, uh, the upcoming talk. Finally, all of this is offered in the spirit of generosity, primarily to ensure that no one is denied access to these practices and these teachings. If you feel inspired to uh, support the teachers, to support me and my lavish lifestyle, much, much appreciated. Um, there's a significant cost that goes into moving, moving this forward and getting it out. And it's super, super supportive. So thank you. All righty. Well, our exploration for uh, the upcoming talk is on what it means to be happy. Is it okay to be happy? in a turbulent world. So how does happiness happen? We'll explore a little bit of that in the following meditation. Um, but a quick little heads up, part of the antidote. Number one, choosing what you already have. Number two, countering judgment with compassion. So let's see where this takes us. As you're ready, you might like to make yourself comfortable. You might want to move your body a little bit, make sure that you're not going to be disturbed for the next period of time. And you might like to explore with your eyes closed, letting your body drift a little bit to the left and to the right. Just rocking a little bit from side to side and just notice if you can detect where is that place where the body's in alignment. You might rock a little bit forward and back. And again, how might you align your body in a way that it's supportive for paying attention, but also for relaxing? And as you scan through the body, you might just sense if you have some good back support. And one thing I like to do is to bring my attention right to the back of my neck into the base of the skull. And imagine you could just flood in a sense of relaxation here. And then imagine you're very, very gently, almost imperceptibly elongating through the back of the neck. And we'll begin or we'll continue our practice by sensing inside, softening, relaxing. And there are a few key areas that when you relax these points, you might notice kind of the spread of softening and relaxation. And one of these is a forehead, just to imagine your forehead smooth.
could you in any way soften the little muscles around your eyes? And taking your time to scan through the muscles of the face, just noting if you can soften and let your face move toward a more expressionless state. And sometimes there can be kind of a, a dramatic relaxation response when you feel the inside of your mouth, and in particular when you relax your tongue. Completely relax the tongue. Let it fill your lower jaw. And notice if you can as well relax the jaw as you relax the root of the tongue. Could you soften through the back of the head and the base of the skull? And you might now imagine your arms are heavy, like heavy drapes just hanging from your shoulders and feel the weight. As you sense from the shoulder joints down through the elbows, and the elbows down through the wrists. And feeling the palms, backs of the hands. And sensing from inside the thumbs and fingers. Could you relax your throat? And is it possible to both feel and soften the space between your breastbone and your spine? Is it possible to soften and feel the space between your navel and your spine? And could you soften and feel the space between your hip joints? And sensing now down the length of the legs, from the hip joints down through the knees. The knees down through the ankles. Sensing from inside the volume of your feet, the tops of your feet and your toes, the heels, the soles of the feet. Just noting on the inside now, is there anywhere inside that could relax or soften? And escorting your attention to an anchor of your choosing, to the, the movement of the breath, 
or to the sound vibrations or maybe the feeling in the palms. Just selecting one anchor that might be your primary tool for this meditation. And in essence, noticing this distinction between when the mind is lost in the narrative or the thought forms, and when your mind is engaged with the senses. And you might just sense right now, or with the next three breaths, how intimately can you feel and experience your anchor from the inside? And as you continue, when you notice your mind far away, noticing if you could just smile inside just a little bit. Notice how gently you can escort your attention back to the experience of breath or sound or feeling. You might notice this distinction again when the mind is in commentary or planning, reviewing, thinking, ruminating. And when your awareness is engaged with the aliveness of here and now. And you might explore when you notice the mind far away to meet it without judgment. This is the natural movement of the mind. And notice if you can associate a sense of pleasure with the return. Allow yourself to again to soften, to feel, to relax, and to re-arrive. And just as you may notice the mind moving into thought and then returning back to the experience of here and now, you may notice at times that you may have a, a sharp sense of your anchor, you know, the feeling of the breath, 
the vibration of sound or the feeling tone in the palms. But you may also notice that you're aware not only of your anchor, but also the background. It's going to be kind of a natural and organic shift in awareness as you both relax and pay attention. You may find it helpful to focus more on the practice of gathering, of re-arriving again and again and again. It can be very helpful if the mind is active or there's strong emotion or unpleasantness. Or you may feel if there is more and more of a sense of here and now, that you might just sense this quality of the observer or the witness. And you might from time to time broaden your awareness, opening to the sense of a flow, perception of all that is changing and noting if you can allow things to be as they are. When the mind naturally gets caught, identified and drifts away, you simply begin again, re-arrive, connect with your anchor. And from that sense of here and now, open from your point of attention to the background, to the periphery, opening again to the sense of what it means to let things be as they are. From time to time, you might inquire, what exactly is happening right now? Just find a word or two that describes what you're aware of. And then you might inquire, can I let this be? Sensing again and again what we might, what we might call the seat of the witness your capacity to observe without judgment, to observe without preference, deeply, deeply relaxed, and at the same time, awake and aware, aware of what is changing, aware of the attitude in your mind, aware of your capacity to let things be.
In these remaining five minutes or so, you might refresh your practice. Again, just sensing from the inside as you feel the forehead smooth. And scan through the muscles of your face. Is it possible to soften, relax the muscles of the face in any way? And feel again the inside of the mouth. In particular, noting if you could relax your tongue, soften the jaw, and just track any inner felt shift of softening and relaxation. And feel the weight and the heaviness of the arms. And sensing from the inside, the palms and fingers and thumbs, and noting if you can sense any pulse or tingling. Could you soften the belly? Can you feel the volume and the length of your legs? And sensing from the inside out, the soles of the feet and the heels. What could relax? What could soften right now? Is it possible to cultivate this sense of relaxation and softening and then bring your attention to your anchor, to breath or sound, the feeling in the palms and blend both this sense of relaxation with alertness? What do you feel? What do you notice? For the next three breaths, you might explore how intimately you can feel, detect new sensations on the inside, here at the point of your anchor. And sensing in your own way this seat of the witness. Awake to what is changing. Allowing things to be as they are. Deeply relaxed and at the same time alert. And you might explore now, if you like, dropping any sense of doing in your practice and exploring the sense of being, letting your anchor fall away, letting any sense of concentration to fall away. What does it mean to simply rest in presence, to allow your experience to unfold all by itself? relaxed and alert and spacious.
And you might explore in the remaining minute, in the next minute, in the absence of effort, what do you feel? What do you notice? As part of your transition now, you might, with your eyes closed, deepen your breath and slow down the breath. Notice how intimately you can feel all the sensations on the inside as your body breathes. Notice the sounds around you. Feel the space in the room. Taking a moment to simply, again, refresh the sense of allowing things to be exactly as they are. Nothing to add, nothing to take away. As you're ready, you can begin to deepen your breath. Let your body move, stretch in any way that feels good for you. Take our time for our transition here. Welcome. You ever see when puppies get what are called zoomies? They have these happy attacks where they just kind of race around in circles. Sometimes humans get happy attacks as well. And I've noticed I got hit with a couple of happy attacks not that long ago. Just being happy for no reason whatsoever. Or in some cases, there was a reason. It was I was outside. It was the perfect breeze. Sun was out. Not too bright. Not too, not too harsh. But that that sense of just happiness was so all pervading. Just contentment, deep contentment. And it got me wondering, and kind of set me up for a question I'd like to explore with you, which which is: Is it okay to be happy? in a turbulent world. So this topic of happiness is a really juicy one. Lots to explore here. Quite often our sense of happiness is based on conditions. I got a couple short things to share with you about that. There's relational happiness and I ran across this advice on how to cultivate happiness in a relationship. Number one, find a partner who can make you laugh. Number two, find a partner who can cook. Part number three, find a partner who really listens to you. And number four, find a partner who is great in bed. And point number five, make sure these four partners don't find out about each other. Conditional happiness. Someone wrote this awful thing where they said there's nothing like the joy on a kid's face when he first sees the PlayStation box containing the socks I got him for Christmas. Oh. And someone else had shared how that when they see ads on TV with smiling, happy housewives using a cleaning product, 
The only thing I want to buy are the meds they must be on. So we have conditional happiness. Your happiness is dependent on externals. And then, and then we have this final thing, which points toward a different approach. And that is basically saying, don't be unhappy when a bird poops on your head. And be happy that dogs don't fly. <laughs> All right, enough. This whole idea of happiness kind of set me on a journey. So what about happiness? Like, like you, most probably, I'm really agitated by the news of the world. I have all kinds of inner caution and hypervigilance. I had the good fortune to, to lead a three-day retreat where I really had time to drop into the practice many, many hours of, of sitting. And, and there's some stuff I'd like to share with you that I think might be helpful. There's this definition of happiness, that, that happiness is achieved when a person can perceive the true nature of reality, unmodified by the mental constructs we superimpose on it. That's a heavy statement right there, just to kind of break that down. You're happy when you see reality unmodified by the stories that you make up about it. So what that points toward is an unconditional quality of presence. Here's what the Dalai Lama said. The Dalai Lama wrote, I believe that the purpose of life is to be happy. From the moment of birth, every human being wants happiness and does not want suffering. Neither social conditioning nor education nor ideology affects this. From the very core of our being, we simply desire contentment. I don't know whether the universe with its countless galaxies, stars, and planets has a deeper meaning or not, but at the very least, it is clear that we humans who live on this earth face the task of making a happy life for ourselves. Therefore, it is important to discover what will bring about the greatest degree of happiness. So what I'd like to explore is how, first, how suffering is part of life but also this capacity you have to be happy. The second thing is when you really take a look at both suffering and happiness, there's a cause. You'll find that there's, there's a cause for your suffering, but there are also causes that result in increasing your capacity to be a happy person. The third point I'd like to explore is that you can be happy, and not only that, you can increase your capacity for happiness in, in all the many different forms. And finally, that there, there are these wonderful practices and techniques and observations that can support you as you become more and more happy. So right now is usually the part of a talk when I tell a story to illustrate a point. And the point, of course, would be to point out the suffering in the world. So I was ruminating, so what story could I tell to really illustrate the fact that there's suffering? And I realized I don't even want to name anything. I don't want to traumatize you <laughs> any more than you are because we're all aware of, of what's going on. I think it's safe to say that you know about the suffering in the world. But here's the question I'd like to offer you. Are you aware of how much the suffering in the world affects you? Are you aware of how much it, it colors your perspective on life? Are you aware of how, how you carry it inside, as they say, your, your issues or in your tissues? The Tibetans have, have a word for, for how we carry this. It's called Shenpa, S-H-E-N-P-A. Literally translated as the clench. And you know what that's like. You, you read a headline and suddenly something's not okay. You can feel this tightening inside, this kind of self-protective mechanism and when it gets chronic, either you're going to move into anger 
anger, judgment, blame, and the fight. Or you'll go into some form of disassociation, or you'll kind of freeze up inside. And what this speaks to is those moments when you realize how, how unhappy you are. That you can begin to kind of sense how all this lives in your tissues. You know, that tight ball in your gut that just won't relax. The, the, the hypervigilance. The, the inability to, to get off the, the wheel of, of anxious thoughts. It really points toward, and not to overstate it, it really points toward the collective trauma in our culture right now. Think of trauma as the simultaneous co-arising of fear and helplessness. We've all experienced it. Either in big, big shocks or in just the little accumulated things that add up. The nervous system is a repository of of unprocessed stress. When it can't get processed, it gets stored. And it shows up in lots of different ways. It shows up as acts of violence. It shows up as acting out of fear, reacting out of fear. Unprocessed trauma is, is, an, is a, a compromised life. When we are locked in trauma, unhealed trauma, we're just doomed to being reaction machines. Eckhart Tolle speaks of the pain body, which is this sort of this collection of, of, of thoughts and sensations that kind of feed on each other. The, the pain actually gives us, it gives us a sense of life and we can see how as we're in this polarized culture, how anger begets anger. There's this escalation of, of stress and suffering. So when, when we're caught in suffering, there's stress, there's an inherent sense of dissatisfaction, there's, a, there's an unsteadiness of mind, there's, there's fear and hypervigilance, a sense of just not feeling safe. Step number one to being happy is to begin to recognize what's between you and feeling happy. This is an exercise that I do from time to time, certainly one that I lead a lot if you've done a retreat with me. As I've been reflecting on this topic, I ask myself from, times to from time to time, so what's between me and feeling happy right now? And if I wait, there'll be a little laundry list will start to emerge. Well, I gotta write this talk, I really want people to like it. There's this nagging dull ache in my neck. I'm wondering, will I get this talk recorded in time? I'm on the road next week, am I ready? There's all this turbulence in the world right now. And when I can just sort of stop and sort of name what's between me and feeling happy, there are two things that occur. One is I realize that there's this landscape of phenomena that my mind has decided is between me and feeling happy. But also I recognize on some level that I'm the one who's naming it. If I can name it, I've begun to sever my identification a little bit with what's going on. So a little Zen pop quiz. If you like, you can close your eyes. And as I ask you this question, just notice what arises and just sense if you can internally name it in, in a word or a phrase. And we'll do a few rounds so you can do this inventory. With your eyes closed, take a nice long deep breath and let yourself respond to the following question. What's between you and feeling happy right now? And say hello to that. Imagine you might place that to the side. And then again, what's between you and feeling happy right now?
saying hello to this. Imagine you could just place the concern for this to the side. And, and once again, what's between you and feeling happy right now? Say hello to that. I'm going to move it to the side. And just take a few moments and just continue on your own. Just naming what, what you sense is between you and feeling happy. And if you like, you can deepen your breath. And if you like, you can open your eyes or remain with them closed. This, this particular practice I find really helpful. And sometimes if I continue naming what's between me and being happy, you know, maybe there are like 10 or 12 things and I feel a little bit of a lift. Sometimes it feels like it's an endless laundry list. But again, in order to cultivate happiness, you will encounter everything between you and it. So the question then is, how do we be with the unhappiness when it, when it arises? So stress and suffering happen in life. There's a mistranslation of one of the lines from the Buddha. And the mistranslation is that the Buddha said life is suffering. The Buddha didn't say that. Suffering happens, but it leads to a second element that kind of gives me hope in the midst of turmoil. These words from Sri Nisargadatta, who pulls no punches. It is in the nature of love to express itself, to affirm itself, to overcome difficulties. Once you have understood that the world is love in action, you will look at it quite differently. But first, your attitude to suffering must change. Suffering is primarily a call for attention, which itself is a movement of love. More than happiness, love wants growth, the widening and deepening of consciousness and being. Whatever prevents that becomes a cause of pain and love does not shrink from pain. Now, to me, that's a pretty powerful reframe. You don't have to believe it, but just to try it on, that if the world is love in action, then we have to view our suffering as a call for attention which in itself, as Sri Nazarkata said, is a movement of love. So any pain that we experience is love in action calling for love. And just as when you are hungry, you'll feel the pain of hunger. That pain of hunger is calling for the compassion of feeding, of eating. So when we explore what's between us and feeling happy, we begin to come up with our stories and we begin to kind of name all the issues that are going on. And the question becomes, well, how do we work with them then? Do we to explore the attitude in the mind or is there another way that allows you to work with it on a more subtle level? And yes. <laughs> It's moving from the story to how it lives on the inside. Primarily exploring kind of somatic, somatic inquiry and somatic awakening. On a retreat, there was a participant who reached out for a private meeting and said, I just have this upset inside but I don't, I don't know what it is. You know, I've been sitting with it. I kind of feel like it's, it's just 
low-grade anxiety. It's like generalized anxiety. There's no one thing. And it's kind of driving me crazy because I feel the dissatisfaction, but I don't, I don't know what the issue is. And so you know that feeling, I'm, I would imagine. Just that time when, like, something's off. I don't know what it is, but something's off. And so we explored. When I asked her, and I said, well, when you just feel the generalized anxiety, where does it live in your nervous system? Can you, can you locate it? And she began to sense that there was just something in her stomach kind of moving up into her heart, a little bit into her throat. It was vague and amorphous. And quite often, what we feel on the inside is vague. We don't know what it is. It's below the surface. And so she began to kind of describe its grip. You know, it was kind of sticky and grippy. It had a quality of acidity to it that she could feel in her belly. It had with it like a sense that, that it was really activated, kind of like caffeinated, and it wasn't, it wasn't going to let go easily. And she began to continue to kind of describe it, its location. There are all kinds of little questions you can ask yourself. Does it have a color? And she it was like a kind of a reddish quality. Instead of a shape, and she could feel it was almost like this, like this tube of grippy fabric. It's kind of how she described it. As she got more aware of it, the other analogy, which is really helpful when you're sensing something that's not clear yet on the inside, it's just the analogy of imagining you're just sharing a park bench together. You're not talking. You're just sitting next to each other, kind of spilling each other out. And so she just sat with it for a while, breathing into it, softening. And then I asked her at some point, I said, is there a sense of what this is all about? And there was a pause. And she said, this is about not having control. I'm sending my kids off to school and I don't, I'm terrified what might happen to them. I don't think I have enough money to retire. I thought I was over my ex, but, but I don't think I am. And she could begin to kind of sense there was something here, this composite of, of these sensations with myriad stories connected to them that were between her and her and feeling free. And you might just take a moment as well, just a little short little form of inquiry. If you like, you can close your eyes. And if you bring your attention to maybe something you've named earlier, that's between you and feeling happy. Maybe something you haven't named. And we're well, going to take just a few minutes to kind of investigate this as you, as you think about this, as you stream attention toward it. Is there a sense of of where you feel this on the inside? If you were to describe it aloud to someone, can you find its location? Does it have a shape? Instead of a color. And just sense what it's like just to be with it, just to get familiar with it, not to figure it out. Is there a sense of what this is all about? And just letting it know you see it making contact with this wild animal at the edge of the woods. We'll come back to it in a little bit. So just as stress and suffering occurs in life, as well as our capacity for happiness, when we look closely at suffering, 
when we look closely at stress, we can find that there's, there's a cause. The cause usually has to do with something holding on, some kind of clinging, some kind of identification. There's a particular model that I find really helpful is when you explore something between you and feeling happy and you begin to investigate it and kind of get in touch with it. You may find that it, it might have something to do with one of three things. The first is it might have something to do with, with a sense of who you are as a separate being, the sense of you and, and that being challenged. Either it might be physical, like just illness or fear of death, or it could be having to do with kind of being identified with your job and your job being over, or being identified with who you are as a partner and feeling your relationship change. The sense of losing your identity. The second is it may be tied into losing a sense of losing control sense of your kind of grip on what your life is or how you want it to be being challenged. Our third is you may find that it can be tied into losing attention, affection, and love in that relational world. And quite often, each of these has with it an element of fear, fear of the unknown. This fear of the unknown, of course, has been through time immemorial, how crafty people have learned how to use fear to their advantage. It's pretty simple. You, you pump up the fear, you show the solution, and then associate pleasure to it. The TV commercial, you know, going in for a chaste kiss, realizing you have bad breath, realizing how horrible you are, buying mouthwash, and suddenly you're sexually alive and potent again. And certainly in these days of scarce resources, fear exacerbates the self-protection mechanism. And I think this global rise of nationalism, it's this, this element of self-preservation finding comfort and coalescing around perceived enemies. But identifying the cause of suffering and stress, it takes incredible diligence to face, to turn toward what's presenting, to get familiar with, with what this is. We are, in essence, kind of fear-based beings, you know, your, your mind is mostly scanning all day long, looking for things that could kill you. <laughs> helpful function. But it's not so helpful when that function is running the show. We see this all around us, of fear being the operative function. But the good news is there's something called the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> this development of the brain, that your capacity for self-soothing, your capacity to remind yourself you've been here before, that other people experience this, you're not alone. It's the, the element of remembering. To be able to see suffering, to be able to see and identify what's between you and feeling happy, and then to inquire how you can be with it. Back to my interview with this woman who was very in touch with this sense of feeling out of control. And she noticed that there was something about naming it, her capacity just to name it. I'm afraid of just feeling out of control. Naming it is so powerful. You know, when you can name something, you sever your identification with it at least a little bit. But then the question becomes, what then, once you see it? And here we are back again to that wonderful Sri Nisargadatta quote of, 
is it possible the universe is love in action? And here, if it's possible to call on loving presence, just to hold that suffering with a sense of care, with empathy, with compassion. So when I sat with this woman and I just suggested, is it possible now that you've located it and you kind of sense how it lives on the inside, what would it happen? What would happen if you were to hold this in some kind of loving presence with empathy or compassion or kindness? And over a little while, her face began to soften. And she said, no wonder I'm looking over my shoulder all the time. No wonder I'm feeling so hypervigilant. I'm so sorry I've been acting this way. And then a little, a little later she said, God, does everyone feel this? She said, I just realized my, my ex who I'm fighting with, he's the same way I am. Our, our anxiety just kind of feeds on each other. And again, she sat with it more. And there's something so powerful about just being with, about not trying to figure this stuff out, but just to get familiar with it. She said, I, I want to be the calm one in my boat. Well, the people I care for, I want to be the one who's centered. I want to be the one who can find joy more easily. And I always like to ask someone after they feel a shift. I asked her, well, now that you've sensed what shifted, what advice do you have to give each other? She said, I just need to be more aware of what feeds me. I want to be outside more. I want to be with people who are important to me more. I just want to slow down and savor what I have because I know it's going to change. Naming what's here, investigating it, exploring what it's like to hold it in loving presence. It's a powerful, powerful practice. So you might again just kind of close your eyes and and if you like, kind of come back to that sense of what's between you and feeling happy and taking a moment again just to sense how how it lives on the inside. And you might explore, is it possible to hold this in some kind of loving presence? If you ever hold it with some empathy or compassion, how does it move or shift or change? And again, you might deepen the breath. You might open your eyes. Just as when you focus on concentration meditation, I get to be present every moment. You're going to notice how you're not. When you focus on the heart practices, when you focus on being compassion, you will notice how petty and mean you are. When you focus on happiness, you will notice all the different permutations of how you are not happy. And that's what the practice is designed to do. The practice is designed to bring to your awareness everything that's between you and feeling happy. And this, in many ways, is love in action. And when you want to be happy more than you want to be right, <laughs> things really begin to shift. These two wings of practice the capacity to name what's true and the capacity to call on whatever it is that is greater than you, compassion, kindness, joy, equanimity, steadiness, serenity, 
to name it, to locate it inside, to be with it, to offer it compassion. It's a powerful, powerful form. So there are two kinds of happiness. And this is the distinction between dukkha and sukha. Dukkha is conditional happiness. That's happiness dependent on externals. When everything's lined up, and it's, everything's going your direction, you're happy. One little tweak, not so happy. Yesterday afternoon, Tara and I were paddling out on the river and we were, we were kind of, we sort of anchored ourselves right in the middle of a rapids. It was really, really beautiful. And, and later we were sort of noticing that she had kind of a stomach ache and I had a little bit of a headache. And we were aware that, wow, this is all wonderful, except for this stomach ache, except for this headache. That's, that's, it was like 95% dialed in, but it was all conditional. Sukha is the opposite of dukkha. It's happiness that is, in, is not dependent on externals. It's that internal space of, of contentment. Sokni Rinpoche talked about when he was a kid, his father was one of the, one of Tulku Ergen was one of the, one of the highest teachers in the tradition. So he had a monastic education and as a little kid, as a little kid, his practice was to be happy for no reason. His teacher said, just be happy for no reason. Try that. Really interesting. Really interesting to be happy for no reason. And one of the ways we can invoke a greater sense of happiness is through gratitude. When you stream attention toward what you appreciate, to what you love, to who loves you, you will begin to kind of open into those, those states. But there's also some really interesting science. In the psychology of happiness, we have the, the PERMA model. And it's very interesting. If you can grade yourself on a scale of, let's say, one to five, five being the best, one being not so good. To what degree do you experience positive emotions? And to what degree do you feel engaged in your life? To what degree do you have fulfilling relationships? To what degree do you have meaning? And to what degree do you have a sense of accomplishment? These five elements are quite fascinating. When I've explored them for myself and when I've explored them with others, the degree to which you have access to positive emotion looking forward to the day, having, having a positive outlook to the degree to which you're engaged, that you actually, you're absorbed into to what you're doing. Relationships that actually light you up, a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, and a sense of, of developing skill, of, of feeling you're, you're developing some mastery in your life. And what I've noticed is when you kind of grade yourself, if any of these is not there or it's low, it will definitely impact your capacity for happiness. Now, in a sense, these are sort of dependent on externals, but they are really interesting components to look at. If there's a punchline to this talk, it's that happiness I believe is your contribution and your responsibility. 
One of the lines that so struck me through this lens of Buddhist psychology, Buddhist philosophy, again, something the Buddha allegedly said, no one will save you. No one's going to save you. You must take responsibility for your own enlightenment. And when I first heard that, I thought I was really hoping someone was going to save me. <laughs> but there's something very powerful about taking responsibility for your enlightenment, which means finding your path. And when I oftentimes talk to people about, you know, I don't really don't know what to do. The truth is most of us know what to do. Do you, do you really need a dietitian to tell you how to eat? Do you need an athletic trainer to tell you what, what workouts would be best? It might be helpful for building skills, but mostly we kind of know what our work is. It's more a question of bringing ourselves to it fully. As someone who can influence the world, we have to look at this through concentric circles. If you are happy, chances are you will influence those in your inner circle. If your inner circle is happy, chances are that they will affect a larger circle. If there's happiness in our families, there will be happiness in our communities. If there's happiness in our communities, there will be happiness in our states. If there's happiness in our states, happiness in the country, happy countries, happy planet. It starts with you. It takes incredible courage to take on the inspiration to be happy. Because what it means is you have to turn first toward what's between you and feeling happy. It'll find you. As Rilke said, do not seek love. Only seek to address the barriers to love. Finding the edges, turning toward them, naming them, bringing loving presence to that is all part of this practice of increasing our capacity for happiness. And it's very hard to do alone, which is knowing that there is a path, knowing that there are others who are excited about this, knowing there are technologies, walking this path with other people can be tremendously, tremendously powerful. Quite often, there is a sense that happiness is out there. And for many, many years or lifetimes, we we seek it through externals. At some point, we begin to explore the possibility that's already here. And happiness is not about adding anything to your life. If anything, it's removing the obstacles. So I'd like to close with a short little reading. And it speaks to the source of happiness. Happiness cannot be found through great effort and willpower, but is already present in open relaxation and letting go. Do not strain yourself. There's nothing to do or undo. Whatever momentarily arises in the body and mind has no real importance, little reality whatsoever. Why, be, why identify with and become attached to it, passing judgment on it and ourselves? Only your searching for happiness prevents you from seeing it. It's like a vivid rainbow which you pursue without ever catching or a dog chasing its own tail. Do not believe in the reality of good and bad experiences. They are like today's weather, like rainbows in the sky.
make use of this spaciousness, this freedom and natural ease. Do not search any further. Do not go into the tangled jungle looking for the great awakened elephant who is already resting quietly at home in front of your own hearth. Nothing to do or undo. Nothing to want and nothing missing. Everything happens by itself. If you like, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes. Happiness is considered one of the highest states. When you can find happiness within, regardless of external conditions, there is a quality of serenity, a quality of presence that truly cannot be surpassed. So part of the path is having happiness as a guiding star and to trust that if love really does inform this universe, that what you encounter between you and feeling happy is calling for love. It's calling for loving presence. And that you can indeed increase your capacity for happiness and joy. It makes me happy to think of you being happy. I hope this was helpful and may you and happiness have a wonderful time together. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to being with you again.